been talking a lot about digital sovereignty. Um, today marks the 22nd day of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, so talking about uh, these virtual front lines, um, you know, many of you like me are wondering what you can do to help um, the Ukrainian people who are forced from their homes, from their countries and into this war. Uh, the Future Proof Summit has put together an initiative so that you guys can put your talents and your expertise um, and pledge them to help the Ukrainian people. I'll give you guys all of the details on how you can get involved after this next panel. Um, so our next panel is going to be looking into the question of can the European tech sovereignty actually help Ukraine defend their virtual front lines? So, we have a panel who is half here, half online. Um, let's welcome them. Uh, donc, uh, Kouze, the executive VP of Europe Technologies, and Julien, visiting fellow of the European Council on Foreign Relations, to the stage. And then online, we have Jose Ignacio, the senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations, and Michael, the IT director of GERT. Thank you so much. Hello, hello everybody. Um, so I'm thrilled to be the moderator of this panel. Uh, the subject is the virtual front line. So how can EU tech sovereignty help Ukraine? Uh, so I'm Kousse, uh, I'm the COO of Eura Technology. And as you cannot say by looking at me, I'm half Russian and Ukrainian. And uh, my family is in the eastern Ukraine, so I'm personally very uh, concerned by the subject. And I'm very happy to, to have uh, with me Julian Ringoff. He's a visiting fellow of the European Council on Foreign Relations. So thank you very much for being here. And uh, uh, virtually, we have uh, Jose. Yes, hi. So Jose Ignacio Torreblanca, he's the head of Madrid office and senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. He's uh, joining from Madrid and he's uh, Julian and Jose, they wrote a bunch of articles on the situation, very interesting, so you'll have some details afterwards. And we have also uh, virtually Yaroslav. Hi Yaroslav. Hi. Hello, everyone. Yaroslav Ashnuk, he's the CEO and co founder of uh, Petcube. So it's a startup. Uh, he's a member of the Keyboard Resistance and he's joining from Western Ukraine. So I'll uh, s s just jump into the topic. Uh, what we see on TV, uh, on uh, TV in France and in Europe, is really uh, the battlefield. So what we see, it's tanks, it's uh, the bombing. And so what is really happening on the virtual front line? Maybe, uh, Jose, can you give us some perspective on the last years of what is happening on the virtual front line? Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I would love to, to be there in presence with you. And uh, in the first place, I want to convey all our solidarity to the people of Ukraine, so brutally uh, invaded uh, by, by Russia. These are like sad times for everyone and for all Europeans. Um, I, on, on your question, I think it is very important that Ukraine is being ground zero for lots of things. Uh, it's been a test ground for Russian cybersecurity attacks and disinformation campaigns ever since, I would say, even in 2008, at the first time that after the Cold Revolution, the country started moving west and therefore to destroy the will of the Ukrainians and to destroy also the will of the rest of Europeans um, to support Ukraine has been a main target of, um, of Russians' foreign and security policy. I'm not an expert on cyber security. I leave that to Jaroslav and, uh, and, and the others. Uh, we just know that, um, you know, we remember the, the, the big attacks in 2015 in which the test was made on how to put down the grids 
um, in, in, in Ukraine, leaving 250,000 people without electricity, and also the most recent uh, attacks as this uh, aggression started. Um, um, uh, what, I, what I've been working most is on disinformation, which is uh, a very interesting feeling in the sense that this is also being ground zero for, for Russia. If you still today go to the um, web page of the European Union, the European Union versus Disinfo, the is, is, is called is, um, Stratcom, is the in communication service of the European Union, and is the website in which all the pieces of this information produced by Russia are gathered and debunked, uh, you will see an amazing figure. There you have a collection of 13,500 pieces of this information gathered and collected by the EAS, by the European External Action Service. 5,200, that is 40% of all these pieces, are specifically related to Ukraine. So Ukraine has absorbed 40% uh, of all EU, uh, of all Russia's uh, disinformation efforts globally, which is quite amazing. Um, and, uh, and this is consistent with the pattern. And, and in the discussions that we have in these days on Russia Today and Sputnik and whether we ban or not these media, it is very important to understand for the tranquility and for the safety of everyone that we are not talking about banning freedom of expression, that in our societies people can still set out uh, outlets, media outlets, uh, Twitter accounts. I mean, they can uh, freely express themselves, and they can even spread whichever views they want, whether they are favorable to Russia or not. The important thing is that we have to understand that both Sputnik and Russia Today and RT are not media outlets, are branches of the Ministry of Defense, and as such has been recognized by their managers, by uh, Margarit Simonian describing uh, uh, RT as, a, as an appendix of the Ministry of Defense to fight information war on the West. And the way they do it is by setting up this media with the aim of uh, creating and cultivating audiences which can then be mobilized in favor of Russia at critical moments. And thank you, thank you, Jose. Uh, I, I understand that it's a, it's really a real point about false information, and I see that Yaroslav is uh, like drinking your words. Uh, maybe can can you uh, jump in, uh, Julian, and tell about um, uh, the virtual front line and what is happening with the bans and technological bans and the future of how it's cornered uh, Russia. Yeah, um, first of all, thank you very much for, for having uh, me here. It's really a, a great pleasure to, after two years of COVID, to be able to, to travel to Lille for this very important uh, summit. Uh, while at the very same time, I'm of course um, deeply saddened by the developments that are forcing us to have this dis discussion on the, on the um, virtual front lines in Ukraine. And uh, so thank you very much, Yaroslav, also for, for joining us and for, for your bravery and the bravery of the Ukrainian people. Uh, I think uh, I can just uh, re-emphasize what Nacho already said. Uh, I mean, it's, you're part of the European family and we try everything we can to, to support you. Um, and so, which brings me to, to your question. Um, so Nacho described uh, Ukraine as being ground zero for a lot of Russian hybrid strategy, right? But it's also this, this tragic war is, is also ground zero in the sense of the, the sanctions that were being imposed by the West, by the US jointly with the European Union and then later followed by a lot of other countries including Taiwan, Japan, South Korea and so on. There has never been sanctions of such breadth and such uh, depth and intensity being deployed at such a speed against an economy at, at the size of Russia. And uh, it's, it's really remarkable how fast and how unified these sanctions were being imposed. So basically within 24 hours of the invasion, you had like export controls on high-end technologies from the US and the European Union that are almost identical 
And I think this is very important to have, I guess, an allied front on this because the result is it really cuts off Russia from almost any important technology it needs to, to further develop uh, its industry economy, but also its military capabilities. And um, so it's, it's, it's really remarkable. And I think it, it also kind of fits in with, uh, with the, the topic of, of, of this whole conference, which is technological sovereignty, because in Europe, there has been a great focus on the defensive aspects of tech sovereignty. We want to be less vulnerable to others coercing us. We want to be more independent from American Chinese technology so that we can pursue our own goals internally. But technological sovereignty also means that when times ask for it, we can use our technological capabilities to support others to, be def to defend themselves against uh, aggression, right? And so the technological sanctions that were imposed now, which really it includes things reaching from simple um, uh, oscilloscopes to microelectronics, like microcontrollers, micro uh, uh, microprocessors, telecommunications, aviation technology, maritime technology, uh, technology for oil refinement, and so on. It's really the breadth is incredible, and when you look at the the regulation, it's really so detailed. So. I guess a lot of a lot of us, including us experts, we didn't really, when the European Union and the U.S. kept saying we are well prepared for when when Russia invades Ukraine. I think no one really believed that. Even Russia didn't believe it, which is maybe why it also didn't work well as a deterrent, right? But now, when you look at it, we were actually well prepared, and so these these sanctions will really, really hamper Russian development in, in the medium and long term if we, if we uphold them. Yes, I, I guess so, Yaroslav. I guess you have a, a, a strong opinion about uh, how EU uh, tech sovereignty is helping Ukraine and specifically what is happening now in the virtual front line. Totally, yeah. Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me, and it's a pleasure to uh, be speaking and sharing my perspectives here. Um, so, I guess just to give you some, some, some of my background, I'm a tech entrepreneur, born and raised in Kiev, spent about six years uh, living in Silicon Valley, uh, obviously have lots of fr friends in, in Europe and in France, including met a bunch of entrepreneurs, and I'm sure so many entrepreneurs just like me are listening to this now. Um, so about two years ago, I came back to Kiev to live and work from there, and that's where most of my team has been historically. So we're a team of about 50 people. The company is called PetCube. We make uh, home cameras for pet parents so that people can watch their cats and dogs remotely. Uh, we have about half a million customers around the world, mostly in the U.S., actually just recently launched in uh, Germany and France, just literally a week ago, while during the invasion already. Um, and um, obviously, 21 days ago, my life has completely turned, um, and um, I, I heard about the first explosions early in the morning, and all of my family, we had to, we had a plan what we're doing if Russia invades, and we basically had a couple hours to pack, pack our things and uh, get into our car and move west. The drive took us uh, about 24 hours, and we moved to one of the Western European, uh, Western Ukrainian cities. So that's where we are now. Um, but we also had, as a company, and I'm also a uh, kind of major shareholder in two other businesses, so about 100 people that um, I, I am responsible for. So as, as companies, we had plans for this case, and we were prepared to evacuate. People had their individual evacuation plans, and we were prepared to the worst, like the financial system is not working. And so we had a lot of backup plans. And... So far, actually, it's not going by, by the worst scenario. And as you all know, uh, Ukraine is holding quite tight. But on the second day of the invasion, on uh, February 25th, I started this initiative online that uh, I, I called the Keyboard Resistance, uh, basically a call to every citizen um, in not only in Ukraine, but in the free world, um, who is 
not going to protect Ukraine with uh, a machine gun and their hands uh, go and protect Ukraine with, with the keyboard, with what they do uh, best. So um, it was kind of an umbrella initiative, uh, um, and lots of different initiatives are nested into it. The call for writers to spend a lot of time, all of their time, writing and covering the stories to journalists and so on. The call to designers to uh, do illustrations, do designs, uh, explain uh, this work through visuals. Uh, the call to philosophers and thinkers to do their thing. The call to hackers, obviously, which has been widely uh, covered in the media. And uh, just for everyone's understanding, there are sort of two different groups of hackers. One is like this grassroots hacktivism where you can basically download a piece of software, um, uh, turn on a VPN, and start attacking different Russian infrastructure using the distributed denial of service attacks, uh, something that most people are familiar with. And uh, there's actually this whole um, like group on Telegram, uh, which is an app, um, a messenger app. Uh, the group counts over 300,000 people. Uh, it is called an IT army. It has been endorsed by Ukrainian Minister of Digital Transformation. And that group it issues tasks daily, which are usually the websites that has to be DDoSed, has to be attacked. And those might be the websites of um, 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 some Russian airfields, which are being used for uh, bombardment of Ukrainian cities. Those are the websites of uh, Russian financial institutions, of Russian governmental institutions, and so on. So that's one group, and I call it grassroots hacking. But there is also another initiative, and, and it's it's many initiatives that are loosely connected. And those are kind of hacker special ops. And those are hackers that are very quiet. They quietly go into different systems and um, try to break them completely and steal the information and so on. And Anonymous is one of the groups that has been uh, uh, pretty, pretty public on this front. And they've been pretty successful as well. So besides that, there are also coders, obviously, programmers that are working in different directions, starting from building websites for different citizen initiatives to actually helping military uh, and working on uh, more complex things like drones or surveillance or processing data from the satellites and so on and so forth. And the business community on itself has also organized and there is uh, this big push towards basically blocking every single Western company, not even the Western, just every single company that still works with Russia and still pays taxes to that regime that kills Ukrainians, kills civilians, women and children, and so on. And on this front, if, if any French people are listening to this, um, I guess you should know that, um, that there are a few major French companies, namely Ashan, Decathlon, and Leroy Merlin, uh, as I understand, those are all from uh, Moulinet's family uh, that are still doing a business in Russia. And I think this is a disgrace. And I think every French citizen who lives by liberté, uh, égalité, uh, fraternité uh, should, uh, should uh, kind of protest against that. And there are countless of these initiatives. So basically what was done in social media is this call for every citizen in Ukraine to uh, basically do whatever they're doing best to find, fight against the aggressor. So in, in certain sense, Ukrainian army is not, uh, you know, uh, 300,000 people who are in the military. It is 40 million people, Ukrainians around the world who are volunteering, donating, doing everything they can in their craft to um, win in this war. Um, and as, as a final piece, something I think we should all understand, and I think something that Ukrainians discovered, and I'm not sure if um, the rest of our European family has discovered already, there is this Ukrainian saying which translates roughly to the, the wolf is not as scary as it is in, in a drawing. Um, so what we realized is that lots of um, so-called Russian might 
is just a psychological operation. Their uh, military is actually in a very poor shape, as we can see from intercepted conversations from the state of the uh, captured tanks and everything else, and even from the tactical ways they're doing uh, their fighting. Their propaganda machine uh, is super weak, as we can see, as the Western world is definitely winning this information war. And um, currently, what we're seeing is a situation where um, kind of EU and NATO and the U.S., they're uh, still saying this, we don't want to provoke Russia or we don't want to do that because that can be a provocation. Well, something we should understand is Russia is being provo provoked only by weakness and someone being scared. Um, it, is, it does not need a reason to do some evil deeds. Um, and think about all the signs we've seen over the last uh, couple decades with poisonings of Skripals in the UK, with um, uh, Russians uh, influencing informationally elections, including in France and the UK, many countries around Europe, um, and stuff like that. So um, I think it, it should be Russia which is afraid of a much more stronger EU uh, not the other way around. Yes, um, thank you, Yaroslav, because this is really the transition uh, to my next question, because uh, it's true that, uh, thank you, because we understand that the virtual front line is really global. It's not about only Ukraine. It's about everybody in Ukraine, but it's, it's really global. And I'd like to, to, to go to, again, to EU sovereignty, because what is happening is a, it's a turning point. So. Really, um, what do you think we still miss today to, uh, to be fully at scale for this European tech sovereignty to be like, effective when we have a dramatic situation as we have today? Um, so, so I think when you look at how the, the European sovereignty debate has has developed uh, in, in recent years. I think while, while there was some focus on it, what, what the Ukraine uh, war really does is re-emphasize how important it is to consider all kinds of aspects of European tech sovereignty, right? So um, I think we're currently doing a big analysis on the status quo of the European Union uh, and all 27 member states individually of how we're doing in terms of capabilities to tech sovereignty and also commitment to tech sovereignty. And I think the commitment is already quite, quite there and it will only become stronger now uh, as a consequence of this war, but we're really still not where we want to be in terms of capabilities. With capabilities, I, I mean our industrial capabilities in important technologies, because if we want to be sovereign, if we want to be able to, to, to have foreign policy that basically aligns with our values and, and for us to be able to, to really enforce foreign policy uh, in line with our values, we need to have a stronger industrial base in high-end in, in high technologies and that includes semiconductors, high-performance computing, artificial intelligence. In all of these areas, if we don't become more independent from foreign actors, there's always this risk of being coerced in foreign policy based on this. And so on, on, on one side, I think we really need to dig deeper into developing European capabilities. And I think there's a lot of movement in this direction. We have the European Chips Act, we have joint undertakings, for example, for high performance computing and so on. And alongside developing capabilities, we also really, and this is maybe an area where the European Union is doing quite well, is to regulate, to protect our values, right? Uh, I mean, one of the good examples is, of course, GDPR, but now we have the Digital Services Act, Digital Markets Act, the uh, AI Act, and so on. And so sovereignty not only means being capable to develop technologies ourselves, but it also means legislating in a way so that we can protect our values even when technology does not come from Europe. 
And so this is, I think, the internal perspective. But as the Ukraine war shows and what we just were talking about, including the sanctions and the European support to Ukraine in terms of uh, debunking disinformation, securing cyberspace and so on, there's a big external dimension to sovereignty, right? And we are actually, uh, and my colleague Nacho and me are working now very hard um, to support the European Union in developing an external digital policy where we really start to looking outside the European Union and see how we can support other countries to become more sovereign. And of course, we need to first really identify which countries are most critical because resources are always limited. And already before the invasion in Ukraine, there was qu quite the focus by the European Union on supporting Ukraine uh, in terms of legislation, in terms of cybersecurity and so on. And I think now what we have to do is we need to support other countries that are threatened by aggressors like Russia to secure their sovereignty in the digital space. And we really need a more holistic approach on like a foreign digital policy to secure European sovereignty, but also to secure the sovereignty of other free democratic countries. Uh, yes, it, it's, it's so important. And Jose, I understand you work very hard on this. <laughs> so he told us. So please tell, tell me what, what do we need to do? Well, I think it is very important to, to highlight that in as much as COVID was an accelerator of trends which were there already, especially on the digital field and digitalization, uh, this war is being an accelerator of trends in the technology field which were already there, but now they're going to be even further accelerated. And with this, I mean technological decoupling, right? Um, an end to interdependence. Uh, the idea that in the past we thought that by being interdependent, we were safe because we wouldn't harm each other, because um, we would need each other to prosper and to, and, and to thrive. Uh, what we've seen and we've been seeing uh, in the last years is that already these trends were there. And it is remarkable that just 20 days, um, just, um, just uh, uh, on the 4th of February, uh, uh, less than 20 days before the invasion of Ukraine, Russia and China signed a global agreement, a strategic partnership with a very specific quote which says, this partnership has no limits, you know, in the in the in, in the goals and in the collaboration that uh, Russia and China are willing to engage in together, which means that this technological pole, which is emerging uh, in China, will also suck in uh, 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 Russia, and uh, and therefore we have to work very hard. And in this, I'm afraid that we have to reach an agreement with the Americans, even if we don't like some of the way they, they look at issues related with the freedom of expression, which is a bit far too lax for what we understand in the continent, and the issue of regulation of monopolies and content and so on. But we will need to, and this is why it's so important that the Trade and Technology Council that currently is set up between the United States and the European Union will deliver on a major and comprehensive agreement on technology, because we need an ethic and human approach to technology. This is what the West should stand for, and this is what the EU should push for, as contrast to technological authoritarianism and, uh, and, and technologies which are being misused to strengthen uh, the, uh, totalitarian governments rather than to help citizens being freed from them. Uh, thank you, Jose. If you, I think we can have a last question. It's about, I think we can start with you, Yaroslav. Uh, what do you wish for today? Yeah, well, that's that's a good one. Um, obviously, I wish peace for Ukraine, and I wish this war to stop as soon as possible, and people to stop dying, and uh, infrastructure stop being destroyed. Um, but speaking of some uh, um, kind of more uh, more uh, directive ideas. Um, uh, I, I think what we need to um, differentiate between is small differences, relatively small differences, that the EU might have with uh, the US and uh, very large worldview differences 
that exist between the EU and Russia or EU and uh, China and at uh, its current shape. And um, something that those authoritarian regimes would really want is to see the West fragmented, is to see it, um, you know, in arguments about these small things, relatively small things, while human rights on the planet are being demolished. So um, I really wish for uh, the Western world and Western digital world to be united and feel this unity in the face of a big threat. And I also wish that this war, as horrible as it is, becomes a wake-up call, becomes a wake-up call, uh, which should have happened way earlier. Shouldn't happen when Russia invaded Georgia. It didn't happen. Shouldn't happen when Russia invaded Crimea. Didn't happen. Syria didn't happen. It has to happen now. Otherwise, the next step will be even more horrible. So I want unity and I want a wake up moment for the whole Western world. Thank you, Yaroslav. A wake up call. What do you wish for? Yeah, I, I guess I can only um, agree with what Yaroslav said and maybe expand on it a little bit. Um, so, of course, the, the first, first wish I have is peace in Ukraine and peace in Europe and, and for European countries to determine their destiny independent of outside aggression. Um, and, but I, I, I also want to emphasize, I think it's very important that we differentiate between Russian politics and Russian people. I think it's really sad what we're seeing now. I think the sanctions being imposed by the West are extremely important. And it was, it, it was the right decision to, to deploy them. But it's not just Russian politics that is suffering from it. It's also Russian ordinary people. We're seeing a big brain drain from Russia, actually. Everyone working in research and IT is now considering leaving Russia because they cannot do their work anymore. So I, I really wish this war, for this war to end for both Ukrainians and Russian people. And then I wish, and I'm, I guess I'm just also expanding on what Yaroslav said uh, and also what Nacho just said, um, this really is a moment where the West democratic countries have to come together and find ways to cooperate in the digital sphere to secure democratic rights online, to, to secure fundamental human values online. And uh, the Trade Technology Council with the US is a, is a good starting point. We're also engaging in digital partnerships with Japan, uh, Singapore, and so on. And I think this can really serve as, as a basis for, for a united democratic digital front against uh, technological authoritarianism, as, as Nacho mentioned. And uh, I think a lot of, we see a lot of good first steps already before, uh, before the invasion, and I hope we can really uh, use that as a base for, for a greater coalition uh, in this area. Yeah, I wish for it too. Ignacio, what would you say? What do you wish for? Of course, uh, I, uh, I want to wish for a secure Ukraine uh, that has a right to live within its borders without threats. Um, this is not about Article 5 of NATO. This is about Article 2 of the United Nations Charter about the right to sovereignty. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and for Russia to honor the commitments that it made time and again to respect the inter inter uh, integral territory of, um, of, of Ukraine in 1991, in 1994, in 1997, you can count them, right? So uh, we need to restore peace and security in, in the continent. On tech, I think um, people are becoming aware, especially on this field of disinformation and technology, that I think Russia has lost the information war. This is very important. You know, they may still do a lot of harm. They may still kill a lot of people. But uh, the, this machinery of propaganda and disinformation in which they have invested billions of euros has not worked, even as that the military has not worked or is not working either as they expected. And I think the information war is something on which we can count very clearly that Ukraine has won, 
there is, despite all this propaganda, moral clarity among the world on who is the aggressor, you know, and who is the victim, which Russian propaganda and disinformation has not been able to obscure. And I think people, both in COVID, because it affected their health, and now with this war, because it affects their freedom and dignity, they realize, you know, how important it is to have a safe and an important, you know, and, and, and to preserve democratic values in the information space, and then and to, to have a zero tolerance on these kind of practices. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for this uh, debate, and thank you again, Yaroslav. We wish uh, that you you will be safe uh, now. Uh, so we we wish for that. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. A big applause for them.